thank you for being with us. It's an honor to finally have this opportunity. How kind of it's you. Been, it's been um, long overdue. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. You're welcome. Mm. Um, okay, so Dami, do you want to start with the questions? Um, I, I would like to first get to know more about you, your background, where did your career start from, mm. what inspired it? Background. Uh, born and raised in Ornicha, in present Anambra State, where I went to school. Then I attended the old Imo State University as a pioneer. It's now Abia State University. I did law uh, there and at the old Nigerian law school on Victoria Island. Then went to the United Kingdom and studied acting drama performance in London and at the University of Exeter in the southwest of England. And got into creative writing as well. And that's about it. That's where it all took off. Mm. That's interesting. So, um, as someone who's you know, evidently talented in like multiple disciplines, um, what would you say is the most challenging of the art forms that you're that you practice? Mm, I need to be a bit particular. Uh, acting, performing, I use them as synonyms, right. perhaps not rightly, uh, has given massive challenges just because of certain emotional and spiritual blocks within me which have sometimes prevented me from expressing or from letting out the creative juices uh, as I could, as I might or as I should. And in terms of writing of course, the challenge has been sticking. Uh, sticking to it, persevering yeah. in the face of sometimes daunting disappointments. Right. Mm. So, um, just speaking of that, um, what, you, what you call the, the disappointments and maybe surprises, uh, what would you say are some of the things that may have surprised you pleasantly you know, in your career? Certain commendations expressions of appreciation, laudations even, mm -hmm. from unexpected quarters have delighted me, heartened me, made me feel that an activity that sometimes seemed misguided or a waste of time had worth. Yeah. And the disappointments have been sometimes when you're entering work, acting work for, for some project and you're rejected or ignored, right. and then you appraise the works accepted or lauded, and you feel that objective appraisal of those works reveal that they're not superior to yours, that they may in fact be decidedly, distinctly inferior to yours, right. and you're ignored, disregarded, so that's painful. Mm. And I'm wondering, at the beginning, at the earlier stages of your career, would you have imagined um, where you are now? I would have imagined that I would have gone further, mm -hmm. however further is uh, defined well, at this stage. But perhaps I wouldn't have imagined my output, particularly uh, as a writer, uh, because I've been more prolific than I would have planned. It just kept coming out, rushing out like, like a stream for years. So that's another side to it. Deserved appreciation. Fine old Brazilian streets of Lagos in decay. Eroded walls and windows cracked and filth display. Where Henry Carr and H. Macaulay strode like kings are rubble heaps and stench and flies with deadly stings. Astounding sums are sometimes spent to smash and raise, constructing hideous piles of concrete, chrome and glaze. In my hometown is a historic church destroyed. The so-called modern bigger one can't fill its void. 
Do we not know our aged piles should make us proud? Part of the heritage with which we've been endowed? Our world abounds with Philistines whose bent I rule. They lack respect for relics, craving just the new. The Britain's rituals and reserve might some detest. With British care for the antique, I'm most impressed. Oh, that we'd master courage, grace, and style today to save our heritage from wreckage and decay. I'm wondering um, what inspires your work or what you found inspires it most. I think my personality, my individuality, my likes and dislikes, although I sometimes write to prescription, like during the pandemic, it's still uh, there were calls from certain journals, establishments, for poems or stories or dramas that addressed it. But apart from those, I write from the heart I write about things which interest me, which fascinate me. That's why quite a number of my works are set in the past. I like history, I have favorite periods. I have plays set in the 1890s right. and, and works set in the 1920s, novels and plays, and set in the nationalist period as well. So... Is there, is there a particular reason why those, those time periods interest you? I don't know why. I don't know why. Just certain things fascinate me. I've taken time to study how the Victorians spoke, their colloquialisms, their attitude to life, etc. And so I rest my interest. That seemed to substantiate the saying that all writing is autobiography, not so much in terms of details of, e of events described, but in terms of interests displayed, aversions and longings and likes, basically. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Highly fascinating. And you discussed earlier about your um, studies into history and culture. Mm. I'm wondering if you found that has an impacted your work in mm. I encountered a short while ago an interesting man from Uguta. And it brought a lot to mind about Uguta that I learned over the years. It's believed there that people of Umutoguma village sleep early so they can count their wealth, their money. Oh, wow. I don't know why. I read a fascinating book called Beyond the Niger and another one called Stepping Stones written by Sylvia Lace Ross, a British woman, an anthropologist, a writer who visited Uguta in 1934 and described a lady called Madame Ruth Onomono Zaro as the dominant figure in the community. And these are all historical studies I did over the years. In the UK, I belonged to a number of libraries. I spent much time in libraries, including Sundays, when the library in the city where I lived opened on Sundays. And Ironically, I learned more about Nigeria and Nigeria's history in England than I would have done in Nigeria. At the School of Oriental and African Studies Library, I learned much about colonial Nigeria, nationalism, the ethnic groups, history, culture, everything there. Like, I mean, what do you think the future of the reading culture in Nigeria is, considering that libraries are not exactly part of our culture per se here. Anymore. I mean, and how does, um, that, how does that affect the artists, so to speak? Well, there's a great deal available online. Yeah. And, and young people are amazingly skilled at finding these facts, right. getting information online. So in my childhood, we handled books. Yeah. And I was a voracious reader. I asked my father or mother for 10 naira or 15 naira in those days yeah. and go to a bookshop in Upper New Market Road on Nature and they emerge with an armful of books. 
with an armful of books, the African Writers Series, orange colored paperbacks, sold for one naira, one naira, 20 kobo. The where James Hadley Chase, the nice Robbins novels, popular writers, which I believe gave me valuable grounding in English. But now so much is online, whatever, whatever, and young people are very good at finding these things and learning. But certain things too have generally suffered a decline, like grammar, even for writers. Just the basics of the language, the basic rules, you can't get around these. Uh, you can't do without learning them. It takes patience and determination to learn them. So there are flaws, there are deflects, uh, there are deficiencies in certain areas. But a lot of knowledge gets exchanged. Mm. Mm. Have you found um, the literature, literary field to have evolved in any interesting way? It's quite rich. In Abuja, when I attend readings of Abuja Literary Society and Abuja Writers Forum, and then there's Anna as well, uh, a lot is happening. People are expressing their experiences and longings, their frustrations, their quirks. There's a lot of activity. The scene is vibrant. But um, again, I, I, I feel I should qualify it because, qualify my statements because these are small enclaves within Nigeria. Yeah. And I know that for the vast majority, to even discuss literature and writing or reading would exasperate them. Yeah. They're, they're struggling extremely hard to be able to put a lump of gari into their mouths every day. So I. I recognize that these circles are, they are not groups of average persons or persons whose circumstances are average. They are, they are generally or mostly well educated, more secure financially than the vast majority. Life goes on. Mm. Individual versus community. Among my race, it sounded like a gong. One cannot be right and society wrong. Some tribes killed twins, deemed theirs abnormal birth. Circumcised girls, what misery to provoke. Tortured widows, left widowers untouched. Columbus proved the Spaniards' view a joke. The truth they knew was that the world was flat. A continent from slavery's thrall awoke when Frederick Douglass rose against the scourge. With birth control did Maristops provoke the wrath of realms which later practiced it. By seeking fellow women to unyoke, did Mary Wollstonecraft enrage the world. The list of those who public's rules revoke, then lives uplift, is one without an end. Minorities and dear societies yoke. It seems that much that's right or wise evolved when one rebutted words society spoke. How wrong the view that sounded like a gong one cannot be right and society wrong. Nonsense. Some of your work deals with taboo topics. Mm. You, you know, to what extent do you think the artist has a responsibility to deal with mm. those sorts of issues? And for you particularly, um, what, what motivates that? And mm. Again, like most of my work, just my feelings, just as I'm urged within. I think a writer has a grave responsibility to be sincerely expressive and daring. There's a price to be paid, obviously, in every generation, and not just for writers. Uh, visionaries, 
philosophers, artists who endure are quite often not appreciated by their contemporaries. Uh, many enduring books have been banned or publicly denounced. I think Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure in the 19th century, that just came to mind. But if one took time to uh, Radcliffe Hall's Well of Loneliness and so on, and again, I think it was the late Victorian wit, uh, Irish-born wit and writer Oscar Wilde, who said that no true artist lived according to the moral dictates of their generation. Um, that's interesting, that's relevant. But what I'm thinking is that if a writer is outrageous because the writer is genuinely expressing genuinely and just casually expressing sincere feelings, the work would be in a different category from the work of a writer who is being gratuitously offensive, maybe gratuitously obscene. Uh, it's a different thing. And we know that one generation's outrage or scandal becomes the next generation's banality or convention of propriety. In the poem, I, one of the poems I recited earlier, I mentioned Dr. Maristops and birth control. I remember that in the 1980s, there was a pronounced drive in Nigeria for birth control methods to spread the message. When Maristops was advocating this in the 1920s, she was seen as abominable she was called a friend of prostitution, a corrupter of morals. We take it for granted today that women study, uh, hold high positions. But it was only in 1948 that Cambridge University awarded degrees to women, when reluctantly the, the doors were forced open and Girton and Newnham colleges were opened for women. After studying, they weren't allowed to receive degrees because they were women. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was fought at Oxford University and at Cambridge University that we, I mean, people could have even cited the Bible to support their prejudice, <laughs> that it wasn't done. So finally, they were allowed to study but denied degrees at Cambridge until 1948. This is recent history. This is recent history. And life goes on. And again, I'm minded to recall uh, this dialogue from a play called Private Lives, a 1930 play by Noel Coward. Let me take a couple of minutes, please, to, to quote from it, because uh, it's quite opposite to what we're discussing. There is this character, Elliot, a man, Elliot, and the woman, Amanda. And the, dial uh, the dialogue goes, I quote, uh, You mustn't be serious, my dear one. It's just what they want. And Amanda asks, Who's they? All the futile moralists who try to make life unbearable. Laugh at them, be flippant, laugh at everything. If I laugh at everything, I must laugh at us too. Yes, yes, we are figures of fun, all right. What happens if one of us dies? Does the one that's left still go on laughing? Yes, death is laughable. Such a cunning little mystery. And Amanda says, Darling, I think you're talking nonsense. And Elliot replies, So is everyone else in the long run. Let's be flippant and pity the poor philosophers. So I unquote, and I think of that declaration sometimes, so is everyone else in the long run. It seems in the long run, it's all nonsense. Uh, your, your acting, you seem quite versatile, like you're able to play a range of different roles. And I, I suppose the question is, what, what would you say um, are some of the more challenging roles you've, you've had to play? Mm. It's hard to remember off the cuff. Um, I know I played a priest, clergyman, in a play, in a film called Into Swans. That wasn't too challenging. 
However, in London, in Hampstead, about 11 years ago, I played a character called Omoro in a play, Mighty Omoro, in a play called High Life, the frustrated, bitter, impoverished man. Uh, and it was a bit of a stretch <laughs> that I, I did it. And what was funny, there were two couples in that play. So I played Omoro with Golda John as my wife, and then we had Ben Ongukwe, Nigerian UK actor, and Joy Elias Rowe playing the other couple. John and um, Ben and Joy were the rich people, right. and then uh, Gloria uh, Golda John and myself played the impoverished couple. But <coughs> we, the, the poor ones, we are fleshy. <laughs> if, uh, we are plump. Right. And these were somewhat scrawny people. Right. And I thought, what's this about? <laughs> I am sufficiently overweight to right. be considered affluent. Because <laughs> our ancestors believed if you're overweight, you were yeah, you feeding well. well yeah. Never mind if, we, if you were gorging on fat. <laughs> and also you were feeding well. Right. So that was a bit of a challenge, but That's we did it. Mm. Well, I guess going off of that, what was the most fun role? the role you enjoyed the most? As a character called Ibehwe, just thought of that, in a Zulu Shofala play at the Cochrane Theatre in London. Uh, that was interesting, that was fun, it had its hilarious moments. He, he wasn't happy, he wasn't having fun, but some of the lines he uttered were hilarious. Mm. Mm. Um, so I guess maybe the, the final question would be, well, what, what are you working on now? Mm, a number of irons in the fire. I think the, the, the main one is a novel. I've been researching off and on for some time now, set in colonial Africa. Actually in colonial Africa, I've done the first chapter, made notes for other parts of it. So that's the main one. That's uh, exciting. That uh, sounds really <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm complimented. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having really, me. Really insightful mm. conversation. Ah, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.